well, uh, hello everyone and thank you very much for being here. Um, I am very happy to introduce here the talk of uh, Professor Maya Nofna, from uh, Professor of uh, Public International Law from the University Jaume I uh, from Castellón, Spain. But uh, I have to say that um, this is a joint collaboration between Down by the Water, Global Commercial and Maritime Archaeology, Eurostory, the Center of Excellence in Law, Identity and the European Narratives, and with the sponsorship of the Spanish Embassy in Helsinki. We are very glad to have this collaboration and to uh, have you speaking here about your new book, Under the Real, uh, Maritime Claims and Underwater Archaeology, when uh, archaeology meets politics. I have to say that the interest of uh, Professor Aznar in, uh, Marita, in cultural underwater cultural heritage and maritime archaeology comes from earlier than he was made professor in Castellón. He has been an active uh, discussant and uh, counselor in several cases involving Spain and other countries for assessing for UNESCO and also as part as ICOMOS. He's also one of the authors of the Green Book of the Underwater Cultural Heritage. Uh, and also he has been uh, an active member of the Museum of Underwater Archaeology in Spain, ARCUA, in, uh, in Cartagena. And uh, he has several publications dealing with the topic. So we are very excited to see what you have to tell us today. Um, thank you very much for being here again. Uh, thank you very much, um, Emilia, for this kind uh, presentation and for the invitation to give this lecture today as an initiative of uh, the seminar Down by the Water, co-organized in this case with the Center of Excellence, uh, Law, Identity and the European Narratives at the University of uh, Helsinki. Um, particular thanks um, must be also given to the Embassy of the Kingdom of Spain, which has kindly funded uh, this lecture. And again, to Emilia Mataix and Veronica Vadillo, who have organized and made possible this event. An event that is being recorded, thank you, Carla, um, to be part of the European Society of International Law lecture series. I said in um, Emilia's uh, introduction, um, this lecture essentially uh, addresses the uh, recent research I've published uh, regarding the complex relationship between two questions, maritime claims and underwater archaeology, apparently distant, but um, as I should try to discuss uh, today with you, closely linked. Gosh. <laughs> Do it. Um, from the 1980s, um, underwater archaeology has been enriched by new technologies and methodologies, uh, but it has also been affected uh, from a legal standpoint by the new global uh, regime established by the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. Um, as well as, as by some um, new conventional and customary rules, some of them slightly changed in UNCLOS and codified by the 2001 UNESCO Convention for the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage, uh, UNESCO Convention here and after. But um, underwater cultural heritage has also suffered, uh, on the one hand, a misappropriation uh, particularly by treasure hunters, looting heritage around the globe. And on the other hand, uh, underwater cultural heritage and underwater archaeology are also misused in some recent maritime claims. This lecture will focus on this um, second point, discussing as a uh, hypothesis that so far, there has been a limited use of archaeological heritage in territorial claims, including maritime claims. That there is a broad acceptance by states of the so-called archaeological maritime zones that overlapped with declared contiguous zones as a legal tool to better protect underwater cultural heritage. And that, however, 
there is a misuse of that heritage and of underwater archaeology as grounds for advancing territorial claims over different maritime areas, particularly the cases of Canada's claim in the Arctic, China's in the South China Sea, and Russia in Crimea and its surrounding waters. Given the uh, limited time we have today, I will mainly focus on this very last point, as well as on some legal and ethical questions. However, I will devote the first minutes of my lecture to make some brief comments on the other points of my hypothesis, as well as some introductory notes. Maritime boundary delimitation is one of the most extensively researched fields in international law, built on the main principle whereby the land dominates the sea, international adjudicative bodies have generally applied a multi-stage methodology when delimiting the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, the exclusive economic zone, and the continental shelves. The existence and location of underwater cultural heritage to be considered in these limitations a special or a relevant circumstance is yet to be assessed by such international adjudicative bodies. In land adjudication cases, vestige of cultural heritage have not been considered relevant evidences of effectivité, as seen, for example, in the discussions of the Prea Biher or Qatar Bahrain delimitation cases before the International Court of Justice. And this is to some extent logical. Too often, archaeological remains provide limited information. And it was not until quite recently that archaeological methodology has allowed to refine the results to the point where we can identify the anthropological origin of found objects or attribute them to an old social group whose successors, however, may be scattered across several modern states currently disputing the same territory. These um, cannot be seen as precluding any possibility of um, alleging the actual doesn't work, so I think. Uh, this cannot be seen as precluding any possibility of alleging the actual existence of an archaeological vestige as proof of sovereignty in a territorial dispute if clearly and scientifically identified, historically attributed, and territorially well-defined, archaeological remains could constitute proof of a possession so long continued as to have become accepted by the law as title, quoting the words of the 1998 arbitral award in the Eritrea Yemen case. The importance of past archaeological activities may help an international court or tribunal determine the best title in a territorial dispute. However, when politics meet and subverts history, when reliable old charts and maps are substituted with wishful mapping, when selective excavations preempt scientific projects, and when biased narratives impaired a comprehensive reading of the past, then problems arise. In too many cases, it must be said, the archaeologists 
may not share the political goal of their activities, despite being instrumental to it. The illiberal nature of the sponsoring or supervising authority imposes limits on the archaeologists' work and on the publications of their results. Being said that as a matter of point of departure, what have been the uses and misuses of underwater archaeology in maritime claims so far? I have not enough time to, to address the positive legal, uh, legal change of the uh, contiguous zone as uh, archaeological maritime zones that if you want, we can discuss later. But let me just discuss with you the cases of Canada in the Arctic, China in the South China Sea, and Russia in Crimea. Particularly due to the impact of climate change and ice melt, traditionally ice covered spaces in the Arctic region are progressively shrinking, facilitating the clearance of new maritime routes. As you may see on the screen in the west lies the Northwest Passage, a way through the waters of the Canadian Arctic archipelago that especially affects Canada's tentative maritime claim in Arctic waters. Our renewed version of Canada's Arctic and Northern policy framework has recently been published at, and it endorses the legal and historical basis for Canada's sovereignty over the Arctic. The expression of this sovereignty is based on a discourse of historical continuity. Such historical continuity of Canadian sovereignty over the high Arctic archipelago is based first on the British 1880 transfer to Canada of the title to territories not already included within the dominion of Canada, a title acquired through British discovery in previous decades, particularly by some naval expeditions. And second, as for the historical land rights of the Inuit people to that vast zone. Under the 1993 Nunavut Land Claims Agreement, the Inuit people surrender Aboriginal title to their lands and waters in Canada. Article 15 of that agreement dealing with marine areas establishes that Canada's sovereignty over the waters of the Arctic archipelago is supported by Inuit use and occupancy. With regard to the Northwest Passage, Canada has declared that it forms part of Canada's historical internal waters. Under the law of the sea as codified by Anklus, these would mean that Canada's rights are sovereignty rights. Canada thus exercise complete control and its domestic legislation would be fully applicable to the route, including the right of passage through it. This has been challenged by the United States, the European Union and its member states and China, but not Russia, which with an eye to its own claim to the Northeast Passage from the Bering Strait to the Barents Sea, allegedly supports Canada's position. What role plays on the water archeology span in this claim? The Northwest Passage is a sea route that once doomed a British expedition led by Sir John Franklin and his ships, the HMAs, Erebus and Terror. 
in 1845. The expedition was seeking access through Arctic to reach us it hoped to find in Asia. However, after several early fatalities, the two vessels became icebound in the Victoria Strait in what today is the territory of the Nunavut indigenous people. The entire expedition, comprising 129 men, including Franklin, vanished. Several contemporaneous expeditions were sent to find the remains of the Franklin mission. More recently, from 1981 onwards, some land excavations and wreck search expeditions were sent to find the remains of the Royal Navy vessels in the Canadian Arctic, which finally discovered the Erebus wreck in September 2014, and two years later, the remains of the terror were located. From the start of the search expeditions, the question of the title to the two Royal Navy vessels hovered in the background. On the 5th of August, 1997, Canada and the UK signed a memorandum of understanding which recognized the UK as the owner of the wrecks, but assigned custody and control of the wrecks and their contents to the government of Canada. Finally, on 26th April, 2008, a deed of gift and memorandum of understanding between Canada and the UK was signed, whereby the UK would transfer ownership of the Erebus and Terror wrecks and of any future recovered artifacts to the government of Canada to be treated as co-owned by the Inuit as agreed in another memorandum between Canada and these Aboriginal people. A change of ownership thus occur between 1997, when the UK was still the owner, and 2018, when the title was transferred by gift to Canada and the Inuit. Unsurprisingly, even before this transfer of title, Canada included the Erebus and Terror among the arguments in support of its long-standing claim of historical sovereignty over Arctic waters, and in particular, the Northwest Passage. You may see on the screen some public statements by authorized Canadian leaders, all pointing in the same direction, that the Erebus and Terror can enhance issues of sovereignty, that the finding was a continuous record of sovereignty, that they laid the foundations of Canada's Arctic sovereignty, and that they were part of Canada's Arctic sovereignty as well. The use of the sunk steel British vessels by Canadian leaders as evidence of sovereignty was thus limited and perhaps misused for political reasons even before the wrecks were actually found. In 2015, between the fines of the Erebus and the terror, Canada's government changed. The political tone used by pre previous administrations regarding the importance of both wrecks also changed. Without relinquishing any of its territorial or maritime claims, Canada is currently engaged in an outstanding archaeological research in the Arctic, taking into account the secular indigenous presence and its interest in the Erebus and Terror remains associated with the Inuit's intangible heritage. 
Much more problematic is the case of China in the South China Sea. This sea features hundreds of sea elevations, including several archipelago clusters and groups of islands, most of them inhabited. The South China Sea is a region of geostrategic importance because of maritime shipping and the extensive natural living and non-living resources it contains. Sovereignty claims and counterclaims are also a common feature of the sea, as you may see on the screen, focused on islands as generators of rich marine areas under the law of the sea. Although its public claim dates back to the 1950s, China's current position can be traced to several much more recent declarations and diplomatic notes. In 2000, China issued a statement titled Historical Evidence to support China's sovereignty over Nansha Spratly Islands. And in 2009, it sent to the UN Secretary General two notes verbal declaring that it had indisputable sovereignty over the islands in the South China Sea and the adjacent waters and enjoys sovereign right and jurisdiction over the relevant waters as well as the seabed and subsoil thereof. These notes included the famous nine dash line map illustrating the boundaries of the areas claimed by China, with, which encompasses virtually all elevation and most of the waters of the South China Sea. In 2013, the Philippines proposed to China that they submit their maritime dispute to arbitration under UNCLOS. But China opposed and did not appear before the tribunal. This notwithstanding, the arbitration took place but did not pose too much weight on Chinese archaeological and historical arguments. Nonetheless, China has reasserted its historic rights over most of the South China Sea, although they might be summed up as a continuous interplay of historical weakness, geographical vagueness, and legal inconsistency. Regarding its historical rights, China apparently maintains that its sovereignty and maritime rights and interests in the South China Sea are established and have been consolidated in the long course of history. The legal nuances of Chinese position regarding its maritime claims are complex and have been discussed in different fora, including the arbitral tribunal. In this lecture, I will only focus on the historical argument linked with underwater archaeology. And the first questions are, I could say is that practice so far shows that China is trying to misuse underwater cultural heritage to support its claims. To this end, for the last three decades, China has adopted a multi-lawyer policy on underwater archaeology that includes well-planned legislative, administrative, enforcement, and political decisions. After the looting and complete destruction in 1985 of the Geldermassen, a Dutch vessel sunk in a South China Sea Reef in 1752, with an impressive cargo of porcelain, and the Chinese decision that this porcelain was of Chinese origin 
and even looted from Chinese territory, China enacted in 1989 a new domestic legislation vesting in the state ownership of all cultural relics of Chinese origin or of unidentified origin or of foreign origin that remain in Chinese inland waters or territorial waters or under Chinese jurisdiction according to Chinese law. To sum up, everything is Chinese. Along with other pieces of legislation, China adopted several administrative and enforcement measures. In the 90s, China began to reshape its underwater cultural heritage infrastructure, including the construction of impressive museums and a new archaeological fleet. And from 2010 onwards, China has performed numerous underwater archaeological activities in continental, coastal, and maritime waters, including those in the South China Sea disputed land and maritime areas. These in administrative initiatives have been accompanied by China's growing assertiveness like the enforcement action in the Scarborough shore of the coast of the Philippines, but claimed by China, that occurred in 2013, when a French Philippine archaeological team was expelled from the area by force. Furthermore, when announcing the finding of the important Nan Hao Wan wreck in June 2011, this was qualified as, and I'm quoting, an historical evidence that can help prove China is the sovereign owner of the South China Sea. And in September 2012, whilst examining porcelain retrieved from a wreck of the Paracels, Chinese Vice Minister of culture was quoted as saying that marine archaeology is an exercise that demonstrates national sovereignty. However, as a matter of fact, most sinologists and maritime historians agree that China's limited presence in the South China Sea does not evidence a continuous display of sovereignty over the disputed waters and some of their maritime features as international law demands. Up to the Song Dynasty, most naval activities were coastal and aimed at repressing piracy. Maritime trade was considered a second-class activity, sometimes prohibited for Chinese people, and essentially left in the hands and aboard the vessels of Arab, Persian, and Indian merchants. Technological innovations, such as the use of compass and naval, a new naval engineering, improved sea navigation, fueling China's new approach to the sea. This was particularly important in the period of China's strongest presence at sea during the Ming Dynasty. The 15th century witnesses, witnessed the fabulous rise, maturation, and decline of the Emperor Yong Le and his Admiral Sen He, who was able to send out and command eight fleets between 1405 and 1433. This has been regarded as the splendor of Chinese naval power and maritime presence, which could provide proof of some of its maritime claims, including those in the South China Sea. However, neither spatially 
nor politically do send her fantastic fleets voyage support these current politicized views. Where did the fleets mainly sail or visit? All the Chinese fleets were headed to the Western Ocean, that is the Indian Ocean, with legs of the journeys north to the Arab Gulf and south to the East African coast down to Madagascar and Zanzibar. The reasons for this naval effort are still disputed, but as agreed by most cyanologists, both Chinese or not, it is incorrect to consider these expeditions as colonialist undertakings in the sense of European colonialism. By the end of the 15th century, expeditions suddenly stopped. China was again absent from today's disputed waters. European conquests, Spain in the Philippines or Taiwan, Portugal in Indian ports, and trade expansions by the various Dutch, British, French, and even Swedish commercial companies closed most maritime routes to China, leading to its disappearance from those waters. This absence was voluntarily adopted by Chinese rulers, not forced by external imposition, at least until the protectorate and opium wars eras of the 19th century. Later, in the wake of the Second World War, China was considered again a great power, and the Maoist revolution reaffirmed its policy. But only since the 1980s, China has clearly reversed its weak maritime position and vigorously returned to the sea. Both relevance and certainty would be needed to transform shipwrecks and their cargo into evidence of a continued display of authority over the disputed land and maritime spaces. History and archaeology are not particularly helpful to China in support of its maritime claims in the South China Sea, which otherwise may be as legitimate as those of its neighbors. If China contends that underwater cultural heritage located in the South China Sea is of undisputedly Chinese origin, it must be corroborated by peer-reviewed scientific assessment, preferably through a collaborative regional or international approach and joint archaeological activities, as provided for and encouraged under the 2001 UNESCO Convention. China may decide to opt in and cooperate with its neighboring states in the South China Sea under the convention system. This would, would depoliticize any archaeological activities in the disputed waters and increase the certainty of any archaeological finds. Let me now turn to the Crimean affair. As you know, Ukraine became an independent state in 1991 following the collapse of the Soviet Union, and Crimea was recognized, recognized as an autonomous republic within the new state of Ukraine. Russia maintained different lease rights on the naval facilities at the port of Sevastopol. In 2003, Russia and Ukraine signed a cooperation agreement on the use of the Sea of Azov and the Strait of Kerch accompanied by a joint statement claiming that historically, 
the Sea of Azov and the Strait of Kerr are internal waters of Ukraine and Russia. However, in 2014, Russia annexed Crimea by force after a contested referendum and officially declaring it, Crimea, a federal unit of the Russian Federation on the 18th March, 2014. Since then, the government of Ukraine has denounced several decisions taken by the Russian authorities, including navigation incidents. In September 2016, Ukraine referred a dispute concerning coastal state rights in the Black Sea, Sea of Azov, and Kerch Strait before an, an uh, arbitral tribunal under UNCLOS. As of today, this tribunal has only decided on jurisdictional issues. In its notification, Ukraine asked Russia to stop any activity endangering underwater cultural heritage located in those waters. Ukrainian claim included arguments related to the preservation of the underwater cultural heritage located in Crimean waters and the invocation of the 2001 UNESCO Convention. The argument advanced by Ukraine was basically that Russia was disturbing when not destroying cultural heritage in which Ukraine has an historical and legal interest. For Ukraine, this was one of the nullification actions performed by Russia to erase any historical Ukrainian presence in Crimea and its surrounding <coughs> waters. The Russian answer was not long in coming. It ignored the accusations regarding the negative impact of heritage sites and also stated that allegations concerning a massive transfer of certain cultural values from Crimea to other Russian cities were absolutely unfounded. Russia further confirmed its position regarding sovereignty over Crimea and everything located in its surrounding waters. And with regard to the blocking of activities directed at underwater cultural heritage, Russia recalled that it was not Russia, a state party to the 2001 UNESCO Convention. From a legal point of view, this creates a highly complex scenario. Since Crimea is not under Russian sovereignty, but rather is occupied by Russia, the law of armed conflict applies. This would leave Russia with no excuse for non-compliance with Ukraine cultural property laws, meaning it should implement its own Russian rules only when absolutely necessary. However, as Russia has argued in keeping with its logic of sovereignty as opposed to occupation, the applicable law in Crimea is that enacted by the Russian Federation or by the Republic of Crimea. This implies that the full legislative subordination of the new republic to Russian lawmakers, who since then have enacted various laws governing archaeological activities and the underwater cultural heritage in Crimea, is the Russian situation right now. According to some sources, the Ukrainian authorities in Crimea were allegedly abusing the practice of international cultural exchanges 
maintaining these with Russian museums and institutions only, including scientific and cultural events dedicated to archaeology and in keeping with the sovereignty logic, presenting Crimean archaeological monuments as heritage belonging to the Russian Federation. As President Putin explained it in extensive before the Duma in the wake of the illegal annexation, Crimea is the spiritual source of Russian sense with a sacral importance for Russia. And this is how Russia will always consider it. As in any other word, truth is the first victim. The Ukrainian figures on looting or destruction are likely overstated. But Russia's attitude does not help clarify the actual situation or its intentions in absence of an effective monitoring system. In any case, what all these claims and counterclaims mean for underwater cultural heritage and for maritime delimitation in the Black Sea is undeniable. The legal status of the Sea of Azov, as well as the extent of the Ukrainian exclusive economic zone on the projection of its continental shelf into the Black Sea are significant maritime concerns strongly affected by the ultimate legal status of Crimea. Buried sovereignty has been found legged and contested by states in their territorial claims. Now, submerged archaeology objects are also being used to support and contest competing maritime claims in different parts of the world. Like archaeology in general, Underwater archaeology has had a complex two-way relationship with diplomacy, military endeavors, and technology, particularly during the Cold War. The finding of the Titanic and the public announcement thereof are a good example. Dr. Ballard was authorized to find the wreck of the White Star Liner once the debris fill of two US nuclear submarines lost in the Northwest Atlantic had been mapped. The public disclosure of the find was also intended to send a clear political message, message to the Soviets that the US was capable of finding anything at the bottom of the sea. But military activities also had an impact on underwater archaeology. During the Cold War, for example, overflights along strategic routes to detect submarine traffic led to the mapping of large parts of the oceans, including the identification of anomalies that remained in place, never moving, thus suggesting the location of wrecks, sometimes of historical importance. But these are politics affecting science. Ethical standards, on the contrary, are founding elements of current underwater archaeology, as evidenced in the 2001 UNESCO Convention both through its main principles and in the annexed archaeological rules. The main purpose of this convention is to preserve, enhance, and make visible underwater cultural heritage as part of the cultural heritage of humanity under widely accepted archaeological protocols. 
When adopting the 2001 UNESCO Convention, Russia voted against the text and publicly stated that it would not ratify the convention. Conversely, Canada and China voted in favor of its adoption. By the UNESCO General Conference on November 2001, none of them, however, have ratified the convention yet. Among the state parties to the UNESCO Convention, at least, underwater archaeology activities cannot be grounds for maritime claims. This is plainly said in paragraph 11 of its article 2. In addition, international scientific cooperation is the bold element of today's underwater archaeology projects. To different degrees, in two of the cases discussed in this lecture, such cooperation has been minimized, if not entirely dispensed with. Arguably, the Canadian case is different since the methodology used, the activities performed, and the published results follow widely accepted archaeological rules, which are not so clearly respected in the South China Sea and Crimean cases. The absence of openly monitored archaeological activities and peer-reviewed scientific publications of the results according to international accepted standards foster suspicions of BZ actions, which are confirmed if the final goal is not the preservation and enhancement of underwater cultural heritage for the benefit of humankind, but claims of sovereignty over disputed waters. International cooperation on underwater archaeology projects seeking to shed light on historical events for the benefit of humankind should not be used as a tool of hard diplomacy, including maritime claims. Instead, scientific soft diplomacy as a projection of soft power has proven to be much more meaningful, fruitful, and useful for states. Thank you very much for your attention.